Hello, everyone, and welcome to our the first installment of our Analytics Breakthrough webinar series. We are really, really elated to have Brian Clifton join us. Brian was uh, nice enough to contribute to our book, Google Analytics uh, Breakthrough, and he is here with us today to share some additional insights in person about top 10 Google Analytics gotchas and I'm sure many other tips and valuable insights. So with that, I'm going to turn it over, oops, sorry about the transitions there. I'm going to go and turn it over to Ferris. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, this is Ferris Alhalu, one of the co-authors of, of our book and, and with us is Eric Fatman, our analytics trainer and, and coach at Enor. Where as Eric mentioned, we are delighted to have Brian with us, and thank you all for, for dialing in. And just uh, as we mentioned previously, uh, those of us who are dialing in live, you can ask questions and answers throughout the session, and, and this session is being recorded, so and we will post it on our site, so those of us who are in different time zones um, can uh, listen to Brian's um, thoughts and, and best practices um, uh, at their leisure. So I think, I would say those of us in the industry, in, in the marketing field or in analytics, I think we know Brian, but I'll, for those of us maybe who are new to the field, I'll, I'll do an introduction. Uh, aside from the formal introduction, I've, I've known Brian for a, for a number of years uh, when he published his first book, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, for those of us who don't know Brian, who don't know Brian he's, uh, he's a measurement strateg strategist and an advisor and he is known in the industry as uh, as one of the uh, one of the experts in Google Analytics. He uh, he has a couple best-selling books. One of them has a number of editions, and he has been uh, uh, he has been uh, lecturing at a number of universities. Uh, I've 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 benefited greatly from uh, Brian's book. I remember when when the first edition of the Advanced Web Metrics book came out. We that was way back then. <laughs> we. Uh, we took it actually internally here at Enor, and we highlighted all the different things that you can do with, with Google Analytics that we didn't know at that time. You know how to how to track you know a download or how to track video. I mean those things were were not uh, that uh, well known. So we really benefited from Brian's book, and I believe we put that in in our uh, in our book. We we gave him credit, and and credit is due, and, and we appreciate what he's done for the industry. So go out and get his book as well, or two books now. Uh, and with that, I'll move it on to um, to Eric. Thank you, Ferris. Just to reinforce the interactive aspect of our webinar, please feel free to ask questions. It's not every day that you get to ask direct questions of Brian Clifton. It's certainly a, 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 a Really great to have him here with us, so make sure to take advantage of the opportunity. Go ahead and ask questions through the presentation. We'll get started by looking at Brian's contribution within Google Analytics Breakthrough, top 10 Google Analytics gotchas, but you can feel free to ask questions that maybe aren't even related directly to the top 10 Google Analytics gotchas, so make sure to take advantage of the opportunity. And with that, we are going to switch over to Brian's contribution in the book, Top 10 Google Analytics Gotchas. We're actually going to bring up the chapter in which Brian's contribution appears. And Brian is actually referenced in many places in the book. He also uh, contributed about a special engagers segment and about enhanced e-commerce uh, discrepancies with your with your backend systems and quality score. So this is Brian's main contribution to the book, but there are really there are really many directly and indirectly. So if we look at our top ten gotchas, um, Brian, we're going to turn it over to to you now. Which which one of these? These are all important. Which are the of these are the most critical for people to really understand. 
Yeah, hi guys, thank you for the, the kind introduction. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's a list of 10, and I think I, I say in there somewhere that uh, it's in no particular order. Um, and you're right, they kind of are all important. Uh, and I think it would be a mistake to just pick one or two and focus on them. I think you, if you're doing the implementation, or if you're a user of Google Analytics, which means you have an interest in the implementation, in other words, where the data comes from, that you have to, basically, you have to know that, then you should look at all of these things. Uh, I don't talk about all of them directly um, in your book, because uh, it's covered in other sections, but, but pretty much you need to cast your eye over all of them. Um, the first one is particularly important in terms of if you do that, if you get that wrong, not only will you uh, incur the wrath of Google because you're breaking terms of service, collecting personal identifier, we collecting personal identifiable information is a big no-no. Google doesn't want to do that. They want to keep everything in in aggregate and anonymous um, because of who they are. You know, they, if they start collecting PII, they will get into trouble. And Brian, uh, just, with for, the, just for the the participants, what? What qualifies as PII? What is clearly not PII? And what are some some gray areas that we, we have to be aware of? I know internally we, we have a, cons a considerable number of uh, PII discussions because sometimes it's, sometimes it's very clear one way or the other, but sometimes it's a little bit ambiguous. Well, the obvious ones are, are capturing anybody's email address, capturing anybody's full name. Um, capturing a postal address, something like that, or a um, social security number. Those are the kind of obvious ones you need to look for. And I would say most of the time it is email addresses and, and people's names uh, that get captured from things like form submissions on your website. Um, the kind of ones that are grey areas are things like banking details and stuff like that, which are not directly personal identifiable information. So, you know, an account number for a bank is not directly PII, uh, but it is a grey area. Uh, and the, the question really is, is you know, are your visitors in any shape or form coming from Europe? Because if they are, the European data privacy uh, laws are much stricter and much tighter uh, than in the US. So if you do have traffic from Europe, you really want to pick uh, you know, the lowest common denominator, which is apply best practice data privacy for European law. So really, especially in Europe, uh, err, err on the side of err on the side of caution with PII. Yeah, essentially, you have to ask your visitors. I mean, um, I mean that's best practice anyway. Uh, it just happens to be written in law in Europe, and they're quite uh, strict about it. Um, but best practice is wherever you're um, working or wherever your visitors come from. Um, is you know if you're going to collect personal identifiable information, you need to ask the visitors. Of course, they need to give it to you. And if you collect that in your back end you know, your database system for, for lead generation or sales, that's fine. Just don't send it to Google Analytics because they don't want it. Right. And the I guess the, the consequences can be can be pretty dire if you do if you do send PII to your to your Google Analytics uh, collection. Yeah, I mean, there's two sides of that. One is Google's concern. Uh, you know, it puts them in hot water uh, if that they, they, by proxy, are collecting the data on your behalf as a website owner. So it breaks their terms of service, and if they find it, um, there is a, a strong chance that you might have your account terminated, your Google Analytics account terminated. Um, you've got the problem of, you know, breaking the law in terms of European law, uh, and you've also got the issue that, if users actually find out about this, not because there's some kind of data breach or, or investigation by any data authority, but just if they can follow a path of URLs that they see in their browser and they see their username and they see even passwords I've seen uh, or their email address passed around as plain text in URLs and they know you're using Google Analytics, then, or, or even if you're not using Google Analytics to be honest, then the potential for really bad, quite disastrous PR uh, is there for you. So in the world of you know uh, high intensity social media, um, it's very easy for a bad story to get out of hand. And, and so the best practice really is don't do it. Uh, but you can identify if you are doing it in Google Analytics and then take the steps to uh, stop it and also clean it out. Right. And even if you are inadvertently, as you pointed out with the URL, even if you are not explicitly saying I'm capturing someone's email as or someone's name as a custom dimension, you could inadvertently be capturing PII by just by virtue of it being added to the URL on a form submission, in which case yeah, that's, that's where it comes from mostly. Yeah, 
Yeah, in which case you could just strip that out in the exclude URL query parameter. So the, the, so the solution is, is pretty straightforward. We just have, the solution is very straightforward. We just need to be, we need to be aware so we can take yeah. that. And I think that's, um, Google that. Analytics is very good at highlighting that. It's being aware of it, of course, best to stop it at source. So if you have a form that is capturing users' details and passing it around the web in plain text as URLs, um, don't do that. You know, if you simply switch the way your form submits data to its server, to your server, from a GET request to a POST request, then that, that pretty much solves the problem because that takes the parameters out of the URL. So best to start it, stop it at the, at the developer's level, you know, where people are building these pages. Um, if you're struggling with that, also as a backup, you can use filters uh, or, as you said, the exclusion parameters uh, field in, in the admin setup to take those out. Okay, so better to, better to rectify it at the source rather than, than try to deal with it with filters. Absolutely. GA. I mean, filters are kind of like a backup. Uh, you really want to not do it because you still have this your fear factor that someone's going to say, you know, they're using their bank uh, website and they see their username and email address being passed around on the internet. It's not a nice feeling and, you know, they could go public with that. Right. Right. Brian, which of the other... 10 gotchas do we want to explore? I think number two, I said these weren't in order, but now I'm looking at them again. I say one and two are probably in order. Um, I think that there's an assumption that data quality somehow uh, either takes care of itself or it's a set and forget process. In other words, you, you, you check and verify everything once at the very beginning, maybe when you're setting up your account, and then you don't have to worry about it again. And that's really a myth because, you know, as we know, websites are constantly evolving and changing, new sections being added, new product launches, uh, new CMSs and CRMs that, that are in the back end, uh, and new redesigns are happening all the time. So. The goalposts are ever changing, and obviously, the more updates and changes you do, the site which typically comes with larger websites and larger organisations. The more chance um, that's going to change. So, over time, if you did a best practice setup with everything, you know, 100% uh, tick -a boo you know, tick all of the boxes, uh, green light, you have good, accurate data that you trust and rely on. Over time, if you did nothing else, if you didn't keep checking that and keep on top of it you will find the data quality degrading and how, how steep that uh, decline is. Uh, it could be a matter of weeks or it could be months, but, but certainly uh, I would be surprised if you're anywhere near the same level of data quality for a proactive website after one year. Um, so it's really important um, you know, to take a, a quite a strong approach to governance of your data. In other words, controlling um, the access, the data collection, the configuration and setup and, and just making sure that you're on top of it, that you understand what level of data quality that you're at uh, and that you either improve it or at least monitor it and maintain it. How do we do that? How do we do that, Brian? Because I think you, you, know, you bring up a, a fundamental point because often we think of implementation as not, you know, not not set it and forget it, but implementation is something that you do and mm -hmm. okay, you've done your implementation and now you're going to be focusing on the on the analysis. So what what are the best ways to monitor any potential degradation to your implementation if you want to put it in those terms? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward technique of auditing. Um, it's something I've talked a lot about in my own books, certainly the last one, um, Successful Analytics. Right. I talk a lot about this in detail. Uh, there should be, uh, I think, a, a screenshot in this section somewhere. Uh, perhaps you can scroll to that. It, um, it should it? have like a sort of summary chart. There it is, yeah. So we just look at that. So it's not a sexy subject. <laughs> that, uh, you know, auditing never really is, whether it's financial auditing or, or any kind of data auditing. Um, and the problem is when you're looking for bad data, there is no flag on that data that says, hey, I'm bad, I'm not very clean, I'm, I'm causing a lot of noise or, or a lot of um, you know, uh, inaccuracy in your data, please remove me. Uh, unfortunately, you have to go digging and looking around for it, um, and it's not so obvious. So it's a time-consuming process. So that's why, you know, it's how people like me um, kind of make a living, if you like, in doing this type of thing. Um, 
but I, I do go through in detail in the book of how to do this, and I briefly summarise it uh, in this section, which is, you know, you go through and you and you literally do sanity checks on your data. So you you look for, uh, for example, uh, if we take item five on that list, file downloads. Mm -hmm. you, know, you literally go to your website, you find the section where there's some kind of file downloads in there, uh, you click on the link and you see if there's um, a signal being sent to Google Analytics, you see if you can find it in your Google Analytics reports. Now the, the auditing process is, is more sophisticated in that, um, in the example that you see, you, the second column there is a waiting column because some of these items are obviously more important to some websites than others. Right. So if you are lead generation site, for example, and you put an awful lot of effort in branding and, and information uh, in your file downloads, your PDFs essentially, um, if that's important to you, then clearly you want to give that a very high weighting um, compared to perhaps um, uh, an outbound link, which perhaps you don't have many on and aren't particularly significant to you. So you would lower the weighting. So that's a kind of business conversation as an implementer you need to have with the rest of the business is how important are some of these features. Um, and then what we do is we give this a score, so um, you know, red is, has a zero score, yellow has a score of five, green has a score of ten, and, and you multiply those scores by the weighting, add them all up, and normalize, so you normalize that table so it's out of a hundred, and then what you can get is a, a score out of a hundred which tells you how complete or how how much you can trust your data, how accurate it is. So in this particular example, out of 100, you can see it's 13.8, and all of the reds indicate uh, areas that need attention. Um, so it's not a sexy process. It's like any kind of auditing. It is quite painstaking that you have to go through there. And the trick, really, uh, which is where I want to go to next, is how can we make this an automated process? Um, that's kind of a hint of, of where I'm going to, is, is to take out the subjectivity out here of, you know, is it good? Is the data coming in, is it there at all, is it missing? That's usually quite a, a no-brainer to answer. Um, but if you're collecting it, is it the right data? Is it accurate? Is it just noise? Uh, or is there part of it missing? So that's when you get the yellows um, coming in, when there's a little bit of um, yeah, subjectivity that comes in. If we can automate that, then of course you take away the uh, subjectivity. But also you have the opportunity of saying, okay, instead of doing a painful audit, manually, which can take two or three days you know, to do this, to work your way through, depending on the complexity of the site, you could actually imagine running this almost in real time. Interesting. Okay. Sounds like, are, are you going to have a special announcement for us at some point, Brian? <laughs> not today, but uh, okay. in the not too distant future. I mean, just imagine that you know, whenever an analyst looks at data, any good analyst will always ask themselves, okay, is this change or, or you know, this peak or this sudden difference that I see comparing year-on-year -year data, is it true? Is it accurate? Is what I'm looking at real data or is it just some kind of artifact, some kind of system change or website change or, or even Google Analytics change? So you always have to ask your, yourself the question before you sort of dig deeper and build a, a hypothesis on what you're doing. You have to say, is this data true and dig down? And so I imagine being able to have this kind of data quality number on an, a line by line item to tell you yes you, you know you are uh, you know, you're on firm ground in, in terms of doing some analysis on this data or whether you need to take a step back and think that perhaps it's not really a real change that you're looking at but actually some kind of um, yeah, system or artifact. I know Brian you've, uh, you've worked on hundreds of sites and a lot of, a lot of clients do you typically see a lot of red in this or do you see a has, have we as an industry, have we matured where we have, we were seeing more green when, when we look at data quality? Yeah, I mean, you are almost predicting my announcement, um, but I will give you a, a quick heads, heads up on, um, because I'm working on a study to show this in terms of, you know, hundreds of, of uh, audited websites, uh, the vast majority of which I've touched, usually done all of it myself, so there's a consistency in the auditing. Um, but when you look at the average score, so out of 100, what is the average score? And it, it's from, it, in order to do this, we have to have access to a, a client's website. So these are people that are proactively interested in data quality. They come to us and needing help. So uh, as a consultancy, we're kind of qualifying them. Uh, in other words, they're not mom and pop shops or anything like that. We're not, we're not scanning the web looking at these scores. We're actually doing some deep consultancy. Um, and when you look at the average score overall, uh, at the moment, the number is coming out as 35.8, so low, 
I mean, quite surprisingly low. And, and I have a rule of thumb, that, which I've had for a long time, which has always been, look, if your quality score is less than 50, then really you shouldn't be doing any analysis. There's just too many holes, too many caveats in the whole analysis. You're just going to run, run into inconsistencies and paradoxes. Um, so therefore, don't do it. Work on your quality score. Get it way above 50 um, before you do any kind of analysis. And, and you know, as I said, for a broad range of some you know, really quite big brands, global brands in some cases, um, it, it's as the average is coming out as just under 36%. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing, and we look forward to it. Reading, reading the study. Brian, would you say just uh, just this is very very compelling? Just for the, would you say that the low quality scores are due primarily to folks not implementing kind of what they need to in terms of like event tracking and goal tracking mm -hmm. and so forth, or the implementations being done? incorrectly or is it a is it a combination of the two i mean it is a it is a challenge it is a challenge to get an implementation really really where it needs to be it's more the latter it's very rare that people come to us who either have no google analytics or or, or a very basic setup um, uh, clients come to us that they already have data and have probably had it from google for, for several years um, and i think they get into problems because usually there's no one person, certainly no one senior person in the organization who has overall ownership of digital data, you know, Google Analytics data or digital analytics data in general. Um, and so you have, you know, a little bit of work done by one agency, a little bit of work done by another agency that's perhaps not an analytics expert, perhaps they're doing some kind of marketing work and need tracking for that particular campaign. You have people internally doing a little bit of work here and there, and, and that can be a varying quality, and then those people leave and, and go elsewhere, and somebody else comes in and, and perhaps does something else. And so what we end up is really with quite a mishmash. Um, so it's not that people haven't implemented it. Um, I'd love to show you the color chart that I'm looking at, but anyway, um, it's really that people have implemented it and have, have usually it's not that they're not smart people, it's usually that they just don't have the experience and therefore don't understand some of the implications of, of not doing this correctly. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, that's where we are. I think, uh, Brian, it ties into uh, gotcha's number 10 about not keeping notes of change. That's cool. Whether it's you're using annotations, you know, within GA or even just outside of GA, you know, I think, and I, again, everybody wants to talk about attribution and and all the all the attractive topics, right? But you know, it's it's really that foundation that you that you mentioned. If we don't have a, a solid foundation, if we don't have confidence in the data, it's going to make the going to be very difficult to, to use that data for for the more advanced you know analysis. So, can you just elaborate quickly on on you know making uh, you know having a process to keep track of what's going on? You know, that gotcha number ten that you have there. Mm. It's really important. It's why I sort of emphasised before that it's important that the, you know, when you're dealing with analytics at li this level, which means you're investing basically, you're investing in third-party agencies like yourselves, like ourselves, or you know, you're buying the premium, the 360 product now, I mean it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year product. Now, when you're investing it, you really need an owner uh, who takes responsibility, and that needs to be a senior person, preferably at board level. Um, and then when that happens, you know, it kind of naturally, you know, you have a kind of um, uh, yeah, a sort of history, if you like, uh, of notes and documentation that happens and, and, and can roll on. Certainly, at the very least, you want to be adding notes of significant change. Uh, I, I don't mean significant change in the data. I mean significant change in the whole ecosystem of what you're doing with your website. So launching a new product or a redesign or a new campaign, those sort of things. You want to get them, at the very least, as some kind of annotation within Google Analytics itself. Um, but of course, that means anybody that's doing any kind of traffic acquisition, you know, bringing traffic to your website, whether it's the marketing team or the PR team or the sales team or whoever, um, they need access to Google Analytics and they need to understand what they're adding and, and the significance of it. And, and that sometimes just doesn't happen. Um, so it's certainly useful uh, if, if it's not happening with Google Analytics, you, you must do it somewhere. Um, but what I, what I tend to find is without a, a senior stakeholder, a CXO stakeholder who takes responsibility for this, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's one of the biggest criticisms, if you like, in terms of where we are as an industry now is 
you know, analytics just hasn't been so far, it's getting there, but so far hasn't been taken seriously at, at board level. And, and I'm talking about digital analytics because board level people are very interested in data. I mean, they, that's how they got their jobs and they have to assess risk and data and, and predict what they want to do in the future all the time. But, but digital analytics or web analytics as it used to be called is, is not really at the moment taken seriously as part of business intelligence. Brian, what's your recommendation for someone who is in an organization now that may have Google Analytics implementation and maybe it's been neglected or it hasn't gotten where it needs to be and this individual really wants to drive the, the analytics program to, to reap all the benefits that you could get from it, but there is not really the level of senior board level support that there that there needs to be. What what would be your recommendation? Because I think many people in in many organizations, even sometimes, you know, large organizations are in the position where they don't necessarily have the the, the support that they that they need. No, absolutely. I mean, lack of resources is a real challenge uh, in this industry, and I, and I found that that is not actually geographically specific. You know, we have. I'm based in Sweden now. I'm an English man uh, living out in Sweden, uh, and it's a very advanced uh, digital nation. Uh, but I see the same problems in Sweden. I was in the Netherlands this week, um, uh, talking to people there at a, a conference event. Same problem there. Same problem in the UK, and when I'm in the US, we have a few clients uh, on the US side. Uh, say, say, same issues of resource, not having uh, the people uh, or the training of those people to sort of work on this. I think as a quick fix or semi-quick fix, I think what uh, is a bit of self-promotion really, but you really need to get these two books. I mean, I, I see your book and uh, as a real um, uh, a great book for, for really helping people do the nitty-gritty implementation. And if, if people can't do that themselves, then you know, work with, you know, find a friend, buy somebody uh, in the IT department, make them a friend, buy them a coffee and talk to them about what you want to do and get them on your side uh, and go through this book with them, because uh, your book, uh, because it's a great bridge between IT and marketer stroke you know, users of analytics. Um, and just work through some of this in terms of you know getting things right and, and setting the right direction. The other thing again, self-promotion, but this is why I wrote my book is to help. If you just zoom out of uh, my second book, uh, uh, the successful analytics, um, is really about zooming out. I used to write about the nitty-gritty. Um, that was what Advanced Web Metrics was about, and there's three editions of that. Um, uh, don't don't get that one now. The last edition was 2012, and, and, and therefore just out of date. But successful analytics is about those people who are you know working down in the weeds, uh, being able to zoom out and try and think about okay, what do we need as an organisation to make analytics part of the sort of bloodstream? Sorry, Google Analytics or even Web Analytics for that matter, part of the uh, uh, the bloodstream because. Organizations do take data seriously, and they do invest millions uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, SAP and things like that. So business intelligence is big, but we need to get web analytics in there at the top table as well. And that does mean understanding how your boss, if you're an analyst or, or a marketer uh, working at the tactical level, you do need to understand how your boss thinks and how your boss's boss thinks and what do they need. Uh, in order to trust the data and have confidence that you can bring this tool and this data to the top table. So have a read of my book because that's kind of exactly why I wrote it. Right, and we've, we've definitely, uh, you know, read through successful analytics and there are tons of really good, you know, high-level questions that you, you really, really want to, to ask yourself. So we, we highly recommend successful analytics. Um, as Brian mentioned, I'm genuine. I've read your book as well. Absolutely, I've contributed, and I've also read uh, the, the breakthrough book. And and these two do complement each other very, very well. I'm, I'm really surprised and thrilled about that. I, I see, and I think I mentioned this this to you offline. I actually see your book as a natural successor to what I was doing. It, it's you know really trying to help people with a nitty gritty get better at what they do with Google Analytics and, and not use it as a hit counter because yes of course at, at one level it can be thought of that as a page view counter as a visit counter um, but as we all know anyone that's logged in there's so so much more detail and so much breadth and you can do so much with it um, but you need to understand a how to use it and also how to implement it and keep on top of that implementation so I mean I love you but and I'm not just saying that because I contributed 
uh, I genuinely feel it, it's a great uh, book for anyone that needs to jumpstart their knowledge in terms of, of actually getting the nitty gritty done. My book doesn't cover any anything about implementation directly itself, and so uh, without sounding too salesy, they are a nice uh, compliment. Thanks, Brian. Sarah, do you want to get to some of the questions? Yeah, maybe a few minutes for Q and A. Uh, we had a let's see, we, we're pretty much at the end, but why don't we just take one question about the uh, the not not segmenting? It was which one was it? it? Was not segmenting your data number three? So not separating uh, customer prospects, and we actually, uh, Brian, we actually do have your engager segment in the book as well. So. Let's actually just there we go. So why don't we talk about the engagers segment and the the importance of segmentation in general? Well, what I'm trying to say when I talk about my particular uh, section about segments is is really at the visitor level, and I emphasise the the O R on visitor. Uh, and what I mean by this is that you know, segments are, are most powerful, most useful when they're applied to people, not sessions. So there's a lot of session-based uh, segmentation in Google Analytics. So you can segment people by device or by country, by operating system, by, you know, did they transact on your site, did they download a PDF. That's great, but that all happens within a session. Uh, it's quite difficult to make that on a visitor level. And so uh, what I'm talking about with segmentation is, is understanding uh, for example, customers versus staff versus leads versus prospects. Now, if I'm a customer uh, and I come to your website, I'm an existing customer because I, I purchased previously, I could come to your website many times, you know, several times, and not transact. Now, if you only look at that on a session basis, then I'm, I just don't look like a customer, and you might treat me very differently. You'd treat me as a prospect, for example. But if you drop a cookie uh, on the visitor, uh, when they become, they first become a customer, or when you can somehow identify that a customer, because perhaps an existing customer who who you didn't track, perhaps they do something on your website, they access a particular page or, or, or a login area on your website, which means, aha, they must be a customer. If you can drop a co cookie on them at that point, you can identify them. Of course, there's caveats, and they have to come back uh, via the same device and using the same uh, browser, for example. But if they do that, then you know that person is still a customer or, or, or a lead or, or whatever it is or a member of staff even if they don't do that kind of uh, behavior again in future visitors so what I'm trying to say about segmentation it is really uh, and it's not specific about the screenshot sorry but, but what I'm trying to say in my section of the book is that you know session based segmentation is interesting but the power really is when you can segment out visitor types so real people rather than yeah a bunch of page views that has a certain um, segment field attached to it right and if we see here uh, in the in the screenshot sorry that uh, we don't have this highlighted here but we see under conditions we see filter and we have users selected as what what we call the the segment scope so instead of Sticking with the default sessions scope, if you switch over to user scope, then you're mm -hmm. getting closer to a, a user a user based view of behavior and segmentation. And even, for instance, if someone watches a video in one segment and then they come back and convert in another segment, you can connect the behavior in one. I mean, in another session, you could connect the behaviors in, from one session to another session by setting a segment scope a segment to user scope instead of session scope and that was a that was a profound addition when that happened in Google Analytics because for most of the uh, lifetime of the tool the scope was only session scope so when user scope was introduced mm -hmm. maybe what was it two two and a half years ago at this point something yeah, like that, that yeah, yeah so that was really really a, a profound change to be able to connect behaviors across multiple multiple sessions and just to finish on that, for those listening, um, check out custom dimensions, because that's what I mean by dropping a cookie uh, on your visitors, because then you determine what makes a, uh, a visitor a, a customer or staff or a lead. The one that you're looking at there is kind of auto-detected by Google, and, and that has obviously a lot of um, uh, caveats there. It may or may not work. Uh, but if you control that, if you drop cookies on your visitors, then uh, it becomes a lot more 
uh, stronger. So I'll just check out custom dimensions on that, and it's scope, uh, scope equals user, as you see here, which I think is right. also scope equals three. If there's a an older version of, of what people are looking at. Right. So potentially, if someone, if your user logs in and you let's say have a back end classification, sometimes we'll say like silver, gold, platinum for different user levels, you can pull in gold as a custom dimension, and then even if that person doesn't log in in subsequent sessions since you've defined that custom dimension at user scope, you're you're classifying that user across multiple sessions. Absolutely. At a basic level, you're just labeling customers versus prospects, but you can get more sophisticated in terms of high-value customers because you know how much they've transacted with you versus medium value, low value. You could even score them in kind of like a marketing automate automation way where you know you give people a score out of 100 as to how valuable they are as a customer or as a lead or as a member of staff or, or as a prospect I mean you can really get very sophisticated in this right okay well, well, first, go ahead no, actually we're, we're a few minutes over so uh, we really appreciate uh, all your feedback and time Brian to share to share your thoughts with us the best practices all, all the things you've learned from <laughs> the trenches so we thank you so much um, here, how you can get a hold of Brian, just go to brianclifton.com slash gotchas. Um, go and get his book. I think that will help a lot. And, and uh, reach out to us as a well second. at Unor if you have any follow-up questions. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure, as you can tell. I think we could spend a lot more than 30 minutes talking about these things, but uh, it's been uh, enjoyable to chat to you. All right, thank you so much, thank Brian. Thank you very nice, much, Brian. Nice yeah, if you'd like to uh, also register for upcoming webinar, uh, our up, our Google Analytics Breakthrough web, webinar series, uh, go to this URL, and we have a actually a list of amazing speakers coming up. So um, hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Again, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Eric. We'll speak with everyone soon. Have a good one. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, everyone.